go. Mel, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, look, like uh, like I said just before the show, um, you know, I've known Ryan now for must be coming up to a year, year or the half, obviously, and uh, his story is so moving. But again, like I said, the crux of his story is um, that initial conversation he had with you, and that led to the transformation. So I'm really, really keen to finally uh, have a conversation with you and hear about your journey and, um, and you know, what got you into mental health, spirituality and addiction and all that sort of stuff. So did you want to just um, unpack yourself for the listeners a little bit about who you are? and, and Yeah, what I'd love to, I love, you know, everyone loves talking about themselves. <laughs> Very true. Um, <laughs> um, so basically um, how far back do you want to go? I, I guess, um, I kind of grew up in this like really split family, kind of divorced family, um, half blessing, half not so much. Um, My stepdad was an alcoholic, was abusive, but then my dad was amazing. So it was kind of confusing. And then, um, yeah, I um, went through some trauma when I was 14 and that, and that really led me down a path of um, using like a lot of drugs and partying a lot. Um, from that young age, which I just thought I was a party animal and that I didn't realise my trauma had affected me. And so that kind of went on and on. And um, I failed year nine and 10 because I wagged so much at school. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think I wagged 50% of year nine, 50% of year 10. Um, My dad was not happy when he found out because it was a private school. So... (laughs) It's money down the drain. But anyway, it's part of my story now. Um, and then I changed my friends and then I um, did okay. I passed VCE and then I'm, I always wanted to get into business. So when I finished school, I studied business, international business. And then I was um, working in international trade for around eight years. So completely different. So I was in import, export, um, traveling and stuff like that, so, which was cool. But... I actually like every weekend I was still taking drugs. I was in really toxic relationships. I um, looked like all accomplished on the outside, but I would always sabotage it and, and, and ruin it. So I I bought a house and I was like 21, I think. And then I had a fight with my friend that I bought it with and we had to sell it. And then I bought another house with my ex and, and then we had like, then I like had an affair. Like it was just, I was just, my life was like crazy, right? Yeah. Um, and it was all about my ego and trying to be happy. And I, and I was a little bit into personal development. Like I read like The Secret and that was about it. And I thought I was like positive thinking and I was like, <laughs> you know, just be happy. And I was creating so much negativity in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and then wondering why, wondering why all this shit was happening, right? Um, yeah. So then I... Um, got to 26 I think it was and I was in my beachfront apartment that I was renting and I had a really expensive sports car and I was looking at the water and I was so depressed and I was like just constantly smoking weed and drinking wine and smoking cigarettes and I couldn't just sit there and I was always like around like toxic people and I just thought I'm so unhappy like on the outside my life looks amazing but I freaking I hate my job I hate like how I feel and I'm like something I need to talk to someone and at the time actually funny enough my friend who had moved to Thailand had come back and he came and hung out with me and he's like wow you should go see my mate um remember you used to see him at parties his name's Emmanuel and um so he's the crux of my story Tom wow (laughs) it goes back (laughs) further Yeah, you'll have to speak. You'll have I'll to speak to Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Yeah, next. Awesome. Yeah, you, yeah. Um, and um, and then I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, I'll I'll have a chat to him. Uh, he's like a life coach or something. So like, I contacted him. He's like, all right, you're gonna come and do a session. I'm like, okay. And then I cancelled because I thought I I had like a good week or something. I'm like, no, I'm feeling fine. You know, that whole, like, it's really unconscious mindset of, like, if I'm okay now, then I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm not okay, then I'll reach out. It's not that growth mindset. So, yeah. And then, like, two months later, I'm like, no, no, I do need help. And I contacted him and I went and and his sessions at the time, like, five-hour sessions. Like, it it wasn't, like, in normal, like, counselling or something like that, Um, which I didn't even know. I just thought I was going for a chat. 
And yeah, I walked out of that session like Ryan walked out of my session, like what the hell? And like the world just looked different. Even colors looked different. I felt different. It was like, it was a real turning point for me. And at the time I had taken, um, I, I had gone out of like a cushy kind of easy job where I was actually really anxious because I feel like I wasn't busy enough to like, I, I knew I wanted to start a business. I didn't know what I wanted to start, but I, I went into a really hard sales job. It was like um, um, 100 cold calls or 300 cold calls a week, 24 wow. business appointments. Um, selling um, same day courier and truck services in Melbourne. Wow. And it was like really good though, because it, you get knocked back like 95% of the time. And that like really helped trigger all my stuff. And so when I eventually went to see Emmanuel, I had already done like a year of that and I was hating it so much. And I was like, I need to start my own thing. And after um, that session, I had been thinking about a business idea for like two years. And after that session, within two weeks, I had designed the product, ordered it from China, set up the website. And I'm like, oh, but you just get in your own way. Like, yeah, <laughs> you, you're just scared of failing. Like people are just scared. And so because I had that business background and then, um, and because of that experience that I had, I'm like, I want to help people like in startups and like business owners. And anyway, Manuel said, do you want to come do a training? So I went and did training. So you might've heard of it. So I, it was like NLP. So neuro linguistics programming, hypnotherapy, timeline therapy. Mm. Um, and so then I went and, um, did that training and and I remember at the time I, I walked into my boss's office I'm like I know that we've already got like three weeks off over like whatever period it was I'm like I need another two weeks off I'm like and I said I don't care if you fire me and this is to the big boss of a company that has like that thousand staff oh. and he was like what and I'm like I walked out I was like whoa where did that come from yeah but anyway I went into the training and halfway through the training a lightning bolt just hit me um, and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm, this is it. And so when I finished the training, I just did a post on Facebook. I made like, I think I made a really crappy website or something. I don't know. And I got a couple of clients and two weeks later, I resigned from my job from finishing that. Wow. Course. I just, and cause at the time, cause I had, um, just had, I had a little bit of money cause I sold cause I, I, me and my ex broke up, we had to sell the house. Um, it was only like 15 grand or something, but I was like, okay, I've got no kids. I've got no pets. I can start again. I'm still young. I've got a little bit of cushion for a couple of months. I'm just going to do it. And everyone um, freaked out, of course. And how are you going to eat? Like, you're crazy. Keep working. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not scared. I'm like, I... I remember my words at the time were like, I'm just going to jump off the cliff and build my wings and, mm. and kind of, uh, if I'm hungry, I have to work harder. So I use that as my kind of motivation. Looking back, I would probably, <clears throat> I would not recommend that to people. Please don't try this at home because there was times when I couldn't eat and it was pretty intense. Um, but anyway, I started working with um, some like people like in startups and stuff like that. And, and I loved it, but, and I um, was seeing people at home and then I, everything was really synchronistic. You know, when you first wake up for those woke people that are listening and just everything just goes bang, 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 like perfectly in place. It's like incredible. So um, it's kind of like the universe saying, yes, now you're on path. Like, oh, this is so much easier. Everything is just happening. Uh, and, some, and someone around the corner from uh, me, I just walked around because I had that sales experience. I just went door knocking and I'm just like, hey, do you have a space I can rent? And someone's like, yeah, I'm just moving out. Um, um, we still have the lease for another three months. You can just take it over and we'll just leave you all the furniture. And I'm like, okay. And so, and it was a quite a big space. So then I just um, made a co-working space. So I subleased um, the spare space to other entrepreneurs um, that had like, there was a marketing person, Facebook funnel person. We all like helped each other and that was awesome. Mm. And then um, they all left and I'm like, all right, what does the universe want me to do now? Like I'm not paying all this rent. <laughs> Yeah. And then um, someone offered me a place in Port Melbourne, which is actually where Ryan walked in for that amazing session that he had. And I got a room there and I, because I got that room there, I'm like, well, I better move to Port Melbourne because like 
Chelsea and Port Melbourne's pretty far from each other. Yeah. <laughs> um, if anyone's in Melbourne, it's, I think it's like 40 minutes or 45, 50 minutes. And we one actually of my live in like, Chelsea. What? <laughs> really? Do you know we live in Chelsea? <laughs> That's hilarious. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's happening so again. You know that, that, yeah, I know. Uh, that white apartment building on the beach near the hotel. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's where I lived. Oh, when wow. I, when all this happened. And yeah. then I had um, next to the um, pathology place upstairs, that was the office oh. um, up there. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> at the time, it was called MKH Empowerment. Yeah. And so then I... And then I just put a post on Facebook, as you do, and I'm like, I'm looking for a room in Port Melbourne, and this girl contacted me. I hadn't even gone there. She hadn't met me. She just asked if I was an Aquarius, and I said yes, and she's like, oh, my God, and you're a coach, and I'm like, yes, and she's like, all right, you're moving in, and I'm like, okay. I'm like, I better just come have a look, and I drove down, saw the new office. It was amazing. Drove there. It was like a penthouse in Port Melbourne with a view of the city water and she was a coach already and then um about a week later after I moved in and a lady walked in that she was working with and she was um like a uh she did um she does like soul stuff so like soul healing and um what's it called um anyway I don't know but she works on the super conscious theta mm-hmm. healing and all okay. that inner child Yeah. And so then she, I said to her, I've got an office next to mine. And I'm like, I think you're going to move in here. And then she did about a month later and all of us three lived together and we worked on each other and we taught each other for about nine months straight. Um, And so we had our own methods, but by the time we had finished, we had all kind of intertwined and then we've kind of, and then that all started falling out as well. And that's when I met Ryan, um, around that time and then that's when Ryan had that session and he started studying and then um, when I had to and when my office burnt down after Ryan's session the day after (laughs) wow did he tell you that no I didn't know that that's insane so (laughs) so okay the place the office that I had um, in Port Melbourne, like off Bay Street, so the guys had renovated this in a historical building. So downstairs was like a health food cafe. And then upstairs was, and it was brand new, and upstairs was like a yoga studio, a counsellor, me and the other healer. And so what happened was me and Ryan had that session. And um, what happened the day, so we had that session, it was like mad energy, like in terms of energy healing, like it was crazy. And then we always make a joke that we burnt the building down because they said some, because we're like, how did the building even burn down the next day? And they said some energy ran to a um, air conditioner that hadn't for about five years because they had rent wow. the kitchen was under my office and that's where the fire started. Whoa. And, and we're like, and Ryan was the air con mechanic and we're like always laughing like the energy was so strong that it actually burned the whole building. Very down. cool. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember I had an, someone coming in for an appointment and I'm like, oh, I'll just get them to meet me there because I'll, I just want to look at the building because I've like a burnt, your whole, your office is gone. <laughs> like the whole building's burnt. It was yeah. opposite Coles on Bay Street, if anyone knows Fort Melbourne. Yeah. And um, and, the, and then I just stood out the front and the other council was looking out the front and I'm like, oh. And I remember the councillor, she was like about, late fifties and she had a whole library in there and all her notes are on paper. Bugger. They were gone. She handled it so well. I'm like, are you okay? Like, yeah. and she's like, I'm fine. I've already found another office down the road. I'm like, Oh my gosh. Okay, cool. Um, wow. And then the guy that was meeting me, he's like, I'm not meant to be meeting you. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to have a look. And then, um, yeah. So, and, and it was funny because the night before me and the girls in their apartment had been partying a little bit that night I I was still working on myself at the time obviously and we had both had a hangover in the morning so one of them came in to both of our rooms and she said oh your both of your offices have burnt down and we're just like I've got a hangover so I can't deal with it right now yes it was really funny we're like all right what are we meant to be doing next it was so weird so then yeah and then Ryan went and studied for a bit and then um and then, yeah, I ended up, like, moving out from those girls and then me and Ryan are like, oh, let's open, like, a centre together. And that was the start of the Centre for Healing or the Melbourne Centre of Healing. So, um, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's such a cool story. I love that. And um, I suppose when someone 
comes to you. Like there's so many things that, that, you know, can be looked at, unpacked, all that sort of stuff before you open up the center for healing. Cause I'm sure as you learn more and study things change and have molded, but what kind of um, coaching were you taking people through at the time? Yeah. So um, before I met those girls, I was purely just doing like what I was trained in, like NLP timeline therapy and hypnotherapy. Um, And so I would just take them through, I just explain cause and effect and then um, do like timeline, but the, the way that Tad James created it, which I found after working with those girls for a year that there's too much like reframing NLP is not very empathetic. Um, and it was funny cause like after I was on my own in Chelsea and business wasn't going good, I actually hired a business coach and I was still very scientific back then, mind you, mm. um, very like atheist, not spiritual. Um, and I hired a business coach, but I didn't know he was a healer as well. And he did some healing on me and I Like for the next day, I was like throwing up the day after I was crying. I had to borrow my friend's dog and watch cartoons. Like it was really weird. Like (laughs) I was like a bully mess. And I remember messaging him because I've never had like a proper deep healing. And I remember messaging him going, what the fuck have you done for me to me? I've just spent six months working on myself. But like, I was like so angry at him. But then obviously after the, so that was like my awakening and then I actually did um DMT as well mm. um which I again I don't recommend now post doing it because I don't believe you need drugs to access that but it was a part of my journey and so all this spiritual stuff started intertwining so by the time Ryan came to see me um it was much more um spiritual there was much more energy work um i was Mm. very intuitive at the time probably more so than i am now like i could scan someone's body and tell them what was wrong with them and stuff like that um so yeah i think um the main thing the 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 big turning point for me was the focus on the emotions Mm. rather than the reframe of the emotions and also um, looking into dr david hawkins work um and as we do now constantly using the scale of consciousness um and that i think for ryan too that was um I mean, that's our kind of key to helping people with addiction is moving, helping them move up the scale. Um, and so whatever means we need to do that with. Um, is that what you asked? I feel like I've gone off track. A no, little that's bit. great. Yeah. I mean, look. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I love to podcast because it just goes yeah. off track all the time. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That's what I want. But, um, yeah. oh, that's brilliant. Could you tell the listeners what you mean by the scale of consciousness? Because I think that's really important. Yeah, for sure. So um, I can even share it on my screen if you want. But uh, so basically the scale is um, Dr. Hawkins scale is he's got basically the vibrational frequency of each emotion and it goes from the heaviest emotion. So we've got um, the heaviest emotion is shame. Um, which is a very low vibration, a low energy. Like it's hard to, um, those kind of people, they, if they're in a lot of shame, they won't look you in the eye. It's a very contracted energy. If you are feeling that shame, it's hard to get out of bed. Like literally your energy is low. Um, and then the next one is apathy, which is like kind of, you know, homeless people, or we can all have times of apathy as well. And then um, apathy, fear, uh, guilt um, and then as you go up the scale the vibration gets higher um, but they're still like the bottom of the scale is these negative emotions um, and then it goes up to um, fear pride anger and it's mm. funny because people like say anger is bad and like reject anger but it's actually the highest vibration of the negative emotions um, and it actually when people are angry sometimes it's actually keeping them out of depression because the energy is higher so um, mm. anger is important and I think if we um, help people not attack people with it rather just process it with it um, it is very helpful we're meant to have it it's good for boundaries as you know and all that and then so he says those are the um, false emotions or negative emotions or um, and then you go up to the positive emotions so the positive emotions on the scale um, obviously the vibrations getting higher 
Um, and so then you've got um, neutrality, willingness, peace, love, joy, enlightenment, those kind of um, mm. emotions. Enlightenment is like the top one. And so basically what we say is that with these negative emotions, because in each moment when if we are creating a perception about what's happening um, and have a strong emotion attached to it, then we are going to kind of lock that in our body and, and build up that baggage over time. So our baseline of how we can feel get, basically gets pulled down into that negativity or that uh, the false perception, basically, he likes to call it. And so when you're pulled down that negativity for you to get up to these positive emotions that we all want to feel, we all want to feel happy, joy. Like that's why we do anything. That's why we like work, have a partner, you know, everything. We're just trying to feel good. Right. So if over time we're bottled all that up, then it's hard to reach those states. So if someone say has a lot of that baggage and trauma and say they have, they try some ice boom, all of a sudden, like never before, they feel really good. And so um, you'll have another person that hasn't created a lot of baggage and they'll have that pipe of ice and it doesn't really do much because they're already kind of up there. They're already feeling okay. So what we like to do is kind of use that scale to say, okay, we need to go and help you release all this heavy stuff so you can naturally get up there so you can naturally stop because we kind of find the focus of, you've just got to stop. Well, that's like telling someone not to take painkillers and they've just had hip surgery. Like yeah. you just sat like how you're going to make someone sit there with all their pain and like battle the rest of their life, not to use, not to feel good mm. when their brain is like screaming for it, their body is screaming for it and then shaming them when they relapse. But again, they're just trying to feel good. So that's the kind of approach that we go and that's where we found the scale is like really helpful with mental health as well, obviously, and spiritual development, whatever. But we just happen to be in the space of what we overcame um, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's such a brilliant way to do it. And, and, and I, I love, I love your approach. I really have learned so much from the both of you because I suppose the, the basic premise there is that, we want to have a look and see why you are feeling this way. And then to get to the mm. root cause quote unquote and help from that perspective, as opposed to just being like, Oh, you know, this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. Don't be doing this because I suppose like just that way of treating the, treating the symptom. If you're saying that the tool they're using to, you know, evoke a positive emotion, if you take that away from them, um, they'll feel incredibly more negative and then it'll just lead to this kind of, you know, positive feedback loop, which is even worse. So I think mm. that's, um, that's so brilliant. And when did you start to have a look at the different approaches and see, Oh, wow. You know, this root cause approach is actually really kicking a lot of goals. Was that like with your own experience or was it with the, the clients as well? Or a bit of both? Yeah, it's really funny, um, Tom, because I have no, because I straight away went into this whole alternative therapies. Like, it's not like um, my parents ever realized I had anxiety or trauma and sent me to a counselor. Or I think I went to a school counselor once um, and I can't even remember it. But yeah, I, it's not like I um, had any old, like, personally alternative method like other methods done to me or just talk therapy obviously I did a bit of personal development so for me it's just like it's just normal like mm. to go to the root cause and there are so many methods and yeah our method is root cause therapy but um it's not just the actual therapy because it is based on about like 10 different methods that were kind of squished together like picked out the good stuff yeah but uh <laughs> yeah um it's like it's like um, for this, like if you're in the alternative space, trying to get to the root cause is kind of normal. And be, and I'm actually in a therapist group where it's more mainstream. So psychologists, counselors, therapists, and I'm going to say you guys, I'm just going to put you in that group. Yeah. But like, yeah, so, um, and I don't know much about you, Tom. Sorry. Um, no, it's good. I never watch Ryan's podcast ever. So yeah. and his <laughs> own ones, our own podcast. I've never listened to one. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> Boosting morale. I, I, love I it. think because I listen to him every day. Like yes. I've seen him break. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You guys are probably the same. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, so it's like, and then I'm, what I'm learning is that you, like you guys, to generalize, is obviously like trying to do the same thing. You're like trying to help people and obviously help them find the root cause as well. But these new tools, they're not, um, uh, what do you call it, um, evidence-based, I guess you would say. So, yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question, I don't know any different, but when me and Ryan are like, what do, you, what do we, like, what's our purpose um, to change the mental health and addiction industry? And some people try and fight the industry and be like, um, what you know, try and poo-poo it. I don't do that. I, I encourage my clients to do other counselling as well because, to be honest, I can't be bothered talking. I just want to do the change work. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm like, yeah, the more you can learn, the better because then when we go to the root cause, you've got more wisdom. Um, but our thing is like, instead of like fighting the system and putting it down, let's let's like infiltrate it. Let's go into the system and change it from within. So mm. it's been really cool. Like we've even gone to doctors and like they just huff and puff and walk out on the meeting. Um, I, I like, we're like advertised to um, counsellors and therapists and stuff. And, we, and you guys are like, and again, I'm just generalising, but like really open to like, additional methods tools you just want the same thing like we all want to all we want to do is help our clients so um there's just different ways to go about it and um sometimes ours is helpful um for people and sometimes just talking is helpful it depends what someone's working through you know um i've had to pause client sessions because i'm like you're we can't like this is in, this is really intense um and your body is not letting us do anymore so maybe you do need to just do some normal like talking stuff so yeah i'm um obviously like we're biased because we're like our methods are best like how do people survive without it but at the same time i really respect everyone else's and every everyone plays a part so mm. yeah <laughs> yeah and I, I would even go one step further and to say that there actually is a lot of evidence coming out for the, the work that you do you know even just one example like straight off the top of my head vincent Folletti in the 1990s talk looking at the correlation between obesity and sexual abuse like mm. you know you look at the symptom mm -hmm. and you look at what happened when they were young over 50 percent um there's so much evidence mm -hmm. coming out and what i love about you know the world you have both opened me up to into just seeing addiction as a as a coping strategy for pain um mm -hmm. is this this very empowering notion that people get from it the idea being that hey you don't have an addictive personality or A, B, and C. Something really frightening and terrible happened to you and it's been scary for you to move back into that state of consciousness. Can I help mm. facilitate that growth with you? And the amount that I have learnt by listening to Ryan, and obviously there's a lot of you coming through that, um, has been really transformative in my own professional work and in my own life. So, I just wanted to take a moment to validate you for that because I think you were playing oh, that down you. a little bit, but it was really important to actually bring that up again. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tom. I'm like tearing up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just really important. It's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it, it's really important. And I think you're right as well. There's, there's so many different approaches to therapy being one, but you mentioned that you like just getting straight into the the deep work and the body work. What kind of work does that actually specifically entail? Mm -hmm. um, so basically uh, what, what we're doing is we're accessing people's um, memory databases. So um, the where, well, firstly, we're just finding out all the, we have our own kind of testing sheet, we call it. And we, Go, and this is a talking part and we go through, we check on all their baggage, we're getting their feedback. I really find that getting that data to show people over sessions so it's not just like they walk out and they don't really know what's changed mm. um, and also making it like client focus, like how do you feel like out of 10 about, you know, all these 20 areas of your life and what thoughts and behaviours do you want to change um, because you've got – you know, you're, con you're consciously like your willpower runs out, right? So I want to know what's what's going on that that we need a shift in that 
that the bottom of that iceberg. Um, and then we go through and we test belief systems. And Ryan might have spoken to you about belief systems, but we see that belief systems are those root causes that are created in traumas. Um, mm. And so we actually use muscle testing for that, which is oh, wow. based on Dr. Hawkins work as well. And also um, kinesiology. Um, and so, um, yeah, cause he would actually use a scale to muscle test anything. You can muscle test um, a book. You can like, the wow. vibration of things. So he's, it, it, it's really well worth the reads power versus force is his okay. main book. Um, and he, and he's like, before you like work with a teacher or um, read a book or, or whatever, you can muscle test the vibration and make sure it's positive. Wow. Um, but yeah, so we, um, because we're not kinesiologists, we help clients muscle test themselves, especially because we work online as well. But even when we had the physical healing center, we would get them to test themselves. And we had a kinesiologist as well that would help support us. But yeah, it's like really easy to do. Um, and we test because you can, we, the issue for me, I find with a lot of therapies is the assumption. So um, you can make assumptions about, oh, you're like this because of that or you think like this because of that, or um, you're this way because I think because this happened. And that's not specific enough for me that I need, I need to like, as a therapist, I want to know, and I want them to know exactly. So when we check the belief system, so for example, we've got, I am alone. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of love. Um, I fear rejection. These kind of belief systems, we're actually specifically checking each one mm. and seeing which ones we need to work on through our sessions. And, um, and then in each session we retest so that we check all that. And then I actually put them into like a slight trance. So I get them to close their eyes. They're still fully conscious and awake because the other thing I find with other like holistic therapies, mainly like Reiki and stuff like that is that when you heal something, um, and I did try Reiki for my anxiety, but I found that it came back a few days later because I wasn't consciously aware of why it was there. It's just like someone getting cancer, but they're not changing their lifestyle. It will come back. So, um, yeah, so I basically get them to shut their eyes and we, we all have memories, right? We, we can access things. We get flashbacks. We might have blocks of time that are blocked out, but that's usually because there's trauma there, as you probably know. Um, and so I'm just getting them to access what's already there. And we literally, we are asking their mind, what is the root cause of like why you fear being alone? You know, why you get anxious when you're alone? Or even we can ask, what is the root cause of this trauma? Because sometimes we can have a, like a breakup, right? A year ago, and I'm still feeling heartbroken. And, and someone can go, okay, I'm going to do like EDMR or some kind of trauma healing on that. But if you do that and it's not the root cause, the symptomology, the, the, the branches of the trees from that root are still going to, can grow back, Right. And so what happens is maybe it was from their first boyfriend or maybe it was from watching their parents fight, you know, um, it could be way early. So we asked their unconscious mind exactly like what is the root cause of this current presenting issue? And so this is more for spiritual people, but it's really funny because like we get clients like 80% of our clients are not even spiritual, but um sometimes they go to past lives so mm. we just say whatever your mind needs to show you as long as you feel better now going forward that's all i care about obviously like i believe in it now biggest atheist before now be biggest spiritual person based <laughs> on my experience but i would never push that on anyone if i believe everyone has to experience that you know themselves Anyway, so then they go back. So it'd either be past life, it could be genealogical, so an ancestral. So they literally, like, obviously we get the DNA passed down from our ancestors to our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. So when that gets passed down, actual traumas, and I think there is um, studies on this, Tom. Um, um, there's a, and there's something to watch in the, um, the shadows in your trauma. No. Um, it's a BBC documentary. I think it's the shadows in your trauma or something like that. But basically people go back sometimes and they're like in their grandma and their grandma's like five and experiencing trauma. And I help them heal their grandma's trauma because that's still getting triggered in their DNA now. Mm. Or they can go in the womb 
Um, so whatever their mum's experiencing, which made it really hard for me, Tom, when I was pregnant, because I was yeah. so aware that my the consciousness of my baby is there and it's recording. So, yes. and knowing like having so many sessions of people that had gone back into the womb and their mum was feeling like upset because obviously there's hormones involved, totally. upset, alone, um, anxious, the baby takes it on. And, and there's also studies on this, but the baby doesn't just take it on only because they're inside the mom, but also they're getting ready for the environment that they're coming out into as well so belief systems can be created then mm. um so yeah whenever i felt upset i was like it's not about you it's, <laughs> it's me like put a bubble around you that's like. so cool that's awesome. <laughs> it's like a whole extra layer of parenting that yes. i feel like i wouldn't have done before and it's extra work <laughs> but like you can't not do it absolutely <laughs> Even me and Ryan are like, oh, my God, like, I feel like we're, like, causing trauma. I'm, like, trying to do healings on him all the time. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I brought you into the world. Like, <laughs> oh, God, that's right. <laughs> um, and so then um, or after birth, so, like, ages, you know, they say ages zero to seven or zero to 14 or whatever. It's, like, when we're mainly imprinted, our prefrontal cortex is not fully there. We can't really – we don't have that critical mind yet. Um, that's why they don't give you your peas till you're 21 because that's when you're 21, that's when it's fully there. So um, I don't know what they call it these days, by the way. They've changed all the colours. Oh, yeah, colors, yeah. All yeah. Things, isn't it? <laughs> it's just showing my age, Tom. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, so it could be after birth. And, and people are funny because they're like, I can't remember when I was like five or whatever, but when they're in this state, in this particular brainwave, it literally will take them there. Um, and I've had people that are like, because when you're there, you kind of feel like, oh, it's not really real, but then you confirm it with your parents or whoever was there. And then it's like, oh, that's amazing. Like, you know, and so we're taking them back to the, and their body, their mind is just like, here it is, bang. And then we mm -hmm. heal it. And then what happens is from that, it's like a gestalt. So on the way back to now, they kind of get flashes of every single thing that happened because of that or similar thing. Um, and mm. we're obviously like helping them release the emotions because it's a negative emotion, that strong negative emotion that creates that belief, a strong belief about themselves or the world. So if, um, especially when they're kids, they think everything's about them as well. So if say, um, you know, your dad like comes and yells at you, or something and or disappoints you and you have this strong emotion occur from it because you make it that there's something wrong with you and you know you create the belief that you're not good enough then that's burnt in and then you you will keep what happens is it creates like a rift in your um and i don't know the technical terms tom again i'm not classically trained so i'm just explaining to you from my own kind of thing um, but it creates Perfect. like a lift a rift in your like subconscious or your soul kind of thing like almost like a black hole that's trying to get healed so you will have that filter of the world with that rift and you will also keep trying to unconsciously recreate it to heal it so just say if i was a woman and that happened to me i would keep attracting men later in my life that would be similar to my dad mm -hmm. and this comes back to like you know, basic psychology, you know, you attract your parents or whatever. Of course, of course, yes. But yeah, you, I'll keep, keep attracting that similar traits to my dad because then a part, like consciously, like I don't want to be with another asshole. Like why do I keep doing this? Subconsciously they are so attractive because your inner child is like, oh, if I can get this person to say sorry to me or if this person finally says I'm good enough, that's going to heal all my childhood stuff. Mm. And not only what that is, like obviously we're going to keep attracting that, but then what happens is the built up emotion, the baggage gets bigger and bigger. So as you get older, it actually, you start getting really emotional. So, you know, you're on like your fourth relationship, they do something, they trigger you and boom, it's like you're like a five-year-old, sorry, five-year-old again having a tantrum or like because all of that, you're not only triggering your five-year-old, but you're also triggering all the other times that it happened and that built-up emotion that you've absorbed as well. So it, that's why sometimes people, like in their 40s, 50s, 
their addictions increase because mm. there's so much more baggage. And and then Tom, because, and the other issue is we're not completing the emotion sometimes because we're not help, like told that it's okay not to feel okay and that's how it gets locked in and it just keeps going and going. Um, either we can get out of it by suppressing it but then sometimes that means that we're suppressing our joy as well. And we call it a heart wall. And so a heart wall is literally these emotions are built up around your heart from all this pain. But then you turn kind of cold and you always keep people at arm's length and you, um, and you don't fully let anyone in. Fair enough because you've been through all that pain. But also you, start, you stop being vulnerable and missing out on that that love that you can feel in your life. So that's something mm. that we do as well is healing people's heart walls. That sometimes people have for like 20 mm. years. Like it's uh, funny cause like everything I do with Ryan, it's so intense. I don't know if he's just an intense guy or whatever. <laughs> he's a lot. No, he's all right. <laughs> yeah. But I did, I healed his heart wall and then he had, when it had like a seizure on the floor of like this new gym that he went to in the bathroom and I don't know, like he said he was like crawling on the floor trying to go into the cubicle. He was like in a pool of sweat. Wow. I'm like, oh, my God. And I tell the other people that I do the heart wall with, I'm like, don't worry, it won't be that intense to you, but I'm just telling you this is what happened. Did he tell you how um, I I shouldn't be doing this, but I think it's funny. Throw him under the bus. Yeah, yeah. Did he tell you how he had a a a seizure in the float tank doing breath work? No, he hasn't told me a lot. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I get to tell you all these funny yeah. stuff. So this is like because we, um, Tom, we were like, we went on a date. This is like a year or two before he came to me for that session. All right. he, we went like on a date. I thought it was a date. Apparently he had no idea. Like I still give him crap, but I'm still upset about it. Yeah, after yeah, feeling yeah. It. I was just joking around though. <laughs> um, but um. Yeah. And then obviously like then he came to me as a client and then we started the business and then I had that heart wall thing and then I had that healed and then I had like a panic attack for two days and, you know, I didn't want to see him. But anyway, I remember the moment where I thought, oh, this guy really needs, you know, some help here. He needs someone to look after him. He, we had just started the business together and he had been doing the breath work, the Wim Hof breath work. And he decided to do it in the float tank. So we had the float tank center in our um, programs and we would walk our clients down the road to do that as well as the healing stuff. Mm. And um, yeah, he just decided to do breath work in there. And you're not meant to because you can pass out when you do the Wim Hof breath work. And um, yeah, he like didn't realize and he blacked out and had a seizure in the tank. Um, And he came out and (laughs) the girls freaked out because his eyes are all red um, there was water all over the floor in the room and he didn't know what the hell happened because he blacked out. And then he's like called me and he told me and I'm like, he's like, should I go to the hospital? I'm like, yes, what the hell? Like, yeah. oh. And he went to the hospital and that's when they told him that he had the blackout and the seizure. And I'm like, this guy, like, he really needs to be looked after. Like, yeah. honestly. Well, and look- I think the moment, the moment that he decided that, I need to be looked after is like I cooked for him and I, Tom, I am not like growing up. I was riding dirt bikes. I, you know, I was up like half in the country with my dad and like boats and stuff like that. And I was not in the kitchen like at all. And I can't cook. And I'm just (laughs) like, I'm really awkward. Like, so bad anyway <laughs> ryan came over i'm like oh I'll cook you something to eat and i have like no patience so i put i think some frozen fish in the <laughs> oven and i cooked it and i couldn't be bothered waiting and i was hungry and i took it out and i think we ate kind of half raw oh that's amazing food. yeah <laughs> he didn't say anything <laughs> and he's like yeah i think that was the moment i decided that you needed to be looked after so now we're looking after each other tom he cooks i'm not at the moment and i make sure that he doesn't do anything too crazy (laughs) it's perfect it's a perfect relationship (laughs) that is hilarious i love that hey um he said right when when he went and saw you because i'm really interested in this in the work you do and and he said okay um, yeah yeah he said that you got him to write with his opposite hand purely just mm. how he feels. Mm. And then it was like he had this very cathartic release. And I was wondering if you could mm. talk us through that. 
<laughs> yeah, for sure. So yeah, this is actually before he came in, like a two days before when I saw him on Facebook. I'm like, hey, this guy took me on a date and then ghosted me for a year. What the hell? And I yeah. messaged him. <laughs> Doesn't even cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then um, he didn't even know it was a date. So I was just in my own little story. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so then I'm like, hey, how are you going? And he's like, not very good. And then I'm like, and, and that day I had just learnt remote healing so I could feel how he was feeling. And so then I said, oh, I can feel a lot of pain in your heart. I had no idea that he had just been drug addict for a year or whatever. Um, and then and then I said, and then he said, yeah, blah, 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 I could write you a book. And I'm like, hey, do this to me. And so what it is, when you write with your left hand, it looks like a child's writing, right? And you're also tapping into a, the different side of your brain. For Ryan, it was his right hand because he's left-handed. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. Another, another lefty. And so, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. And then, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so I just said to him, I want you to write down. He didn't actually do it how I said for him to do it, but it worked well. But mm -hmm. he, I just said, write down how you're feeling. It was basically like, journaling but you just dump all your crap that you're feeling onto the paper and yeah it's just like our our inner child so yeah he wrote down those words um from a different part of him that he's mm. probably not used to tapping into or that he knew was in pain which is like his inner children you know so mm. yeah it is really powerful to um to tap into different parts of you and the thing with journaling is like people are like I don't want to do like dear diary this is what I did today like it doesn't have to be like a high school girl kind of journaling our journaling is like get a pen don't worry about what the hell it looks like I think I've got a um, thing here and just write down all your disgusting horrible thoughts that's awesome um, it's like um, I think I've got some here no, not in this one. It's like, don't worry about it being neat. Just like, be just like, why the F is this happening to me again? Well, like, all the disgustness in your head, just like get it down um, on paper, get it out. And then you write until you can't stop writing. And then, um, then when you stop either, the wisdom drops in straight away or it comes a little bit later. So, yeah, that's what I was mm. just trying to like get him to tap into. And because... I was the same as him. I was unconscious of my consciousness. But what is it? You become conscious of your unconscious. That makes you conscious, right? Yes. So I was, I thought that my past was in my past and I thought that my emotions were just gone. Once I've had an emotion, it's gone, right? And so when you get someone to tap into how they're feeling, um, like with, in a inner child kind of way, they're tapping into a part of them that they have been trying to not feel constantly. Um, so that connection in itself is like really powerful, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think everything you said there makes so much sense, just like intuitively. I think people listen to that show, listen to that part of the show, just then will be like, oh, that does make sense. And if you could give someone like a framework, like you touched on it then as well, but would the best approach for someone just to be to start writing and, and seeing where the pen takes them? Yeah. Yeah. Because I'll like when we have like, you know, and I used to be, I used to like chain smoke. Like I used to sit there and be like, have all this negative self-talk and all these like negative um, flashbacks and stuff like that. And I, the only thing that I knew how to do was to distract myself. Mm. So I'll put on the TV, I'll put on the music, I try and reach out to someone, I'm go have a smoke, have a joint, like anything to kind of dull that down. But the last thing that we want to do is like face it, right? Or mm. like listen to it. But people need to know that, that's actually the true way to get past it and move on is to like, you know, face that monster because the more that you don't want that monster to come in, the bigger it will get. Um, yep. you let it come in, give it a hug, like, <laughs> let it, let it come through. But we're not taught that, you know, like, and not everyone, especially in the generations before, like going to therapy or doing this kind of stuff is like, is, is the opposite of like what society says is good. Like mm. we want to pretend that we're good all the time, that we're happy. Thank God now there's been a huge shift um, 
in terms of that where like more and more people like it's just a normal thing to do now is to face your stuff um and you and not pretend yeah so I remember like if I like growing up you know I saw people drinking and stuff and like partying and 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 you just think that they're cool and that they and they think that yeah. they're cool but they're actually just not happy without it and it's just me looking back going wow <laughs> You know, like they just we're just never taught to face our shit, like yeah. or sit with it and and know that there's another side of it. You know, like I remember when I was practicing, I practiced on my mum when I was first training, and she actually had a huge awakening. But as you may know, Tom, as people are older, they have more baggage. She had a huge dark night of the soul. She was so scared. She was like mm. about to check herself into hospital. And I'm like, uh-huh. no, no, it's a good thing. I'm like, I know you're scared. It feels like you're dying. Parts of your ego are dying because you realize you're the way you are now because of all this stuff that's happened to you. Um, and, but there's another side of it. You know, and she when she got to the other side, I'm the favorite child now. Mm-hmm. Very <laughs> I'm cool. I'm the one who helped her wake up. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And we just have our conversations, and my brother and sister, they're like 10 years younger, they just eye roll us the whole time. But <laughs> like, it's, and we're trying to get them to do work, but you can't force people, you know, especially they saw me growing up just partying and being an idiot. I'm the last person they will listen to. Like that I'm that person in their play, right? You know, everyone is like a certain person in, in your mind. That's, that's one of the issues Tom with people that are over, trying to overcome addictions, but their family still seeing them as what they did um, mm. and not seeing them as recovered. That's a, you know, a really big issue, um, which is totally fair, but yeah, it's like a whole nother subject of like who are who who are we in our own play? What is our what is our identity? And that kind of loops back to what you were saying, like, okay, I've been diagnosed with bipolar, okay, I've been diagnosed with depression, okay, I, I have it for the rest of my life and I have to manage it. That is so in liberating initially for people because they're like, okay, now we know how to treat it. That's awesome. But then it becomes a life sentence of them not being able to over know that they can overcome that identity and not be that and know that, that that's just an experience, not who mm, they are. Mm. That's so, I think that is such an important thing you just said there, that idea of the trade-off between like temporary reassurance for long-term rigidity, you know, like, yeah. Oh, I, this is who I am now. I have depression or I'm a, I mean, you even see people's Instagrams and they say, I mean, their Instagram is like, I am anxious or anxiety with Tom or something. And it's just like, wow, the Mm. attachment that you have to the label that was assigned to you by a total stranger has really Mm. impacted your life in the long run, you know? Mm, For sure. And like I said, it is initial uh, initial relief because they're like, that totally, I'm not crazy. Like that explains why I am the way that I am and maybe they can get better treatment but then it should be focused on all right we treat you for now would say the antidepressants or whatever just just to make you feel better now so now we can do the deeper work Mm. so now we can actually go and start healing this you know Mm. um and i think that's a shift that needs to happen rather than i've had i have clients that they're like i'm i've been on antidepressants for 20 years and i'm just like (sighs) and they're depressed still and i'm just like okay, like I can't say anything about that, but just let's just go and release that. And if you feel as you're feeling better, manage that with whoever prescribed that. But um, yeah, there's so much fear put into people. I think in the medical industry, they just are not, um, they're doing the best that they can. They're not aware of all these change methods or they're not open to it because Mm. of that framework they were taught to not look outside of, I guess. Yeah. And then, uh, then here Mel comes and she's like, here's a pen right with your opposite hand. <laughs> and it's all out. <laughs> They're like, oh my God, I feel so much better. Yeah, ex- exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, look, I, I think the way, I really love what you said in the beginning where, you know, you're not going against the industry, but you're trying to like infiltrate the industry and then like yeah. a broken horse from it. I think that's so good because, you know, you, you speak to people that, um, you know, have taken the opposite end of the clinical approach and gone, Oh, it's all bullshit. And 
I personally feel like there's just not enough respect because the Institute got us mm. this far and, you know, it's like maybe it's outdated, sure, and we need you to come in and help us change and progress. But, um, you know, to people say, like, these absolutist claims, like it's all bad and it's like, well, I mean, there are good and bad things and, like, we're always trying to change and grow. Yeah. I I think if you have that closed mindset, like for example, I'm in that therapy group. I get so much out of it. If someone posted a blog the other day and they're just a classically trained psychologist, I opened it and I learned so much. I Mm. think if I was against um, that industry, then I would be closed off to all of the wisdom that's been accumulated over the last hundred years. You'd be crazy not to tap into that. Mm. And, 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 and work with that as well, um, as well as what we're doing. I think we, if we can all share, um, it's again, we just want to help people. It's about the outcome, right? Mm. Um, yeah. So I'm definitely like open to that. I think, and I think with that mindset, we haven't even attracted people that have attacked us. Um, I probably only had two people in the last five or six years that have really um, been in fear about what we're doing and really questioned our qualifications and question our knowledge. Um, and I just like, I just show them the testimonials. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, like, I'm just like, All right, I hear what you're saying and I, and I understand like your fear and your concerns about your loved one or about what we're doing. But like, the results don't lie. Like me, Ryan and I opened the center for healing and we're like, look, we're just going to give it a shot, right? We're going to make up these programs that worked for us. And if it doesn't work, our business will not survive. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause we had no money. You know, I was like just chilling in this penthouse with those girls. We weren't doing much (laughs) at all to be honest, (laughs) Um, but just learning and like working on ourselves. Ryan had just finished being a drug addict. Like we're like, let's just give it a shot. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, does it? Yeah. And then it worked, you know, like, um, and it, and it kept working and it wasn't for everyone. Like, you know, we're not saying we have a hundred percent success rate. I think you're, you're lying to yourself, you know, if, if someone says their method does that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we've been really lucky and it's really funny now because we set ourselves up as a mental health and addiction clinic and, and those initial stages of people like rejecting us as we reached out, we kind of stepped back and just worked on being as good as we can. And now we get referrals. We have people contact us saying, Hey, my doctor said I should come see you. Hey, my psychologist said, and I'm just, when I, every time I see that, I'm just like, Oh my God, like, so good. you know, it's awesome. Mm. It's so good because we haven't like pushed it out there. It's just, um, I think, the even the mainstream are like some people do need alternatives some people have tried the mainstream for 20 something years and it, and it hasn't worked and it's good to have a different option you know mm. and then recognizing that and seeing that you know maybe this person would be better with something more spiritual i think it's really beautiful and we feel really honored at, like every time we see that for sure mm. I, yeah. I love how you said before ryan had just been f- <laughs> he'd just been finished up with doing you know his drug addiction <laughs> stuff as though we just finished like a job <laughs> in finance it's like oh yeah you know do the whole drug thing you know now moving <laughs> on i'll do private equity now <laughs> yeah uh, that, that was awesome no and i I, yeah. I totally agree with you i think um results do speak for themselves and um i think results are a testament to how much fucking work you guys and how much you guys love the shit you do and the reason why you love it is because you have that anecdotal experience and, and even that mm. is like, Hey, this stuff really worked for me, you know, pack all mm. that on with the amount of study you guys have done. I think it's just, it's really brilliant and it's really important, important work. And, um, it's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I love, I love having conversations. Like this is our first conversation, but it's going to be, um, yeah, be many more. I think Mel will be really good. Hey, what's, okay, happening awesome. for, what's happening for center of healing now? Cause you guys are obviously overseas. So tell us about some things you're doing. Yeah. So it was really cool, Tom, because I really, um, give credit to my soul because last year we were really coming up to some challenges with, um, some tax debt. We're trying to keep up with all our salaries because we had, um, a couple of full timers and a, 
um, you know, the healers working us for us and the kinesiologist and having our big healing center and the rent and everything. And obviously we have a ba- we have a baby as well. And so we got to the point where we're like, we are teaching people to be peaceful and we are stressed out of our minds. Like, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> this is so incongruent. Yeah. Ryan's having breakdowns and like getting depression and like I'm getting anxious and, um, you know, we're, it, it just got to the point where just again, like back in the early days when things start getting really resistant, mm-hmm. it's like the universe mm-hmm. saying you need to change your path. Right. And so I think this was in like November last year, we, we told the girls, we said, we're sorry, we, we are moving online. We have to let you guys go and, and everything. And, and then they're like, you know, like anything that we can do, can we like, can we like put the word out there? So many people would support you guys. We're like, no, nah, we, we need a break as well. We yeah. want to isolate. We literally said we want to isolate. Mm. Right. It's so wow. funny. Um, yeah. And then I said, and then, so we started um, moving the stuff online and I started um, creating, you know, our own method practitioner training as a supplement to that, just in case the online stuff didn't go okay. Mm. And so then by December, I, we started selling that and it was going well. And I said, and we still had the key to the office until like the 5th of Jan. And I said to Ryan, it's going well. Um, we can work online now. And I was really happy to be at home with my son um, yeah. and be there for him and when he needs me. And so um, I said, we said, oh, maybe we should like, where do you want to live? We can just live anywhere now. <laughs> and then we're both like, oh, we're moving to Thailand with our exes. Um, Thailand's really nice because a year prior we had gone to Bali um, pre-child mm-hmm. and we really loved it. But we hadn't been in Thailand, both of us about nine, 10 years. And we're like, yeah, okay. And it was like literally such a short conversation, Tom. It was like weird. And we're like, yeah. Let, and then we just started, um, I just started organizing that. And we um, organized, we packed up a house in a container and um, yeah, we moved here by, um, I think it was the 10th of March. And um, I think we lived at mum's for a week, my mum's house, because we've just had no house. We're just full nomad with our baby. And um, yeah, we got here and obviously all the COVID stuff started going down. And I'm just like, this is crazy. Like we are like so, our souls saw this coming. Like I had the foresight. And it all meant that we were already planned to isolate. We already moved our business online. Like this is freaking amazing. Mm. And so we were, we're still over here. Um, and so we've been in lockdown basically in paradise um, where the cost of living is like not as good as it used, but as cheap as it used to be, but it's still um, cheaper. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, we're just like, we have to come back. My dad actually passed away two weeks ago. So I need to come. And luckily he, um, his wishes, he was a really social guy, Tom. Mm. So it was really surprising, but his wishes was to just, um, have be cremated and have his ashes thrown in Lake Yildon, which is where he has a house where he lives. Um, so my set mom said, take your time in coming back. Um, so we are going to come back and do that. Um, but yeah, um, I can't even remember what you asked now, Tom. But Neither yeah, can I. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, what's the center for healing? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. So basically, like, initially, I'm just like, the center for healing is in the ether. It was a physical center, and now it's an online center for learning for Very people cool. that want to learn how to be healers, also for getting healing. Mm. Um, so where um, Brian started making courses with another therapist, Matt, and we've got our practitioner training, and we keep pumping out more online courses and um we're still doing the exact same mental health and addiction programs online as well uh but just um because people were coming to our center only once a week anyway for the two-hour healing sessions because it's very like intensive work so um we just transitioned that to online the results have been just as good so the center of healing is just uh, it was really funny because ryan's friend he he needed help with his website this is when the the idea implanted so this is like October last year when I was stressed out of my brain and um, yeah, his friend asked, Oh, can you help me with my website? Cause he's not very good at technical stuff. And then I'm like, Oh, you're working online. How's that? Cause he's like 
therapist and he's mm. like, yeah, I've lost a few clients so I prefer in person, but I've gained clients from around the world. And that really like hit me. And then I listened to, um, and I love listening to business stuff. And I listened to Denise Duffield's book called Chillpreneur. And I'm like, I am not that, I need that. And I listened to that. And she really like talked about the online stuff. So yeah, that all kind of went in my brain. And then when we first went online, Tom, we had a few clients that like, people put us down or, and we lost a few clients, but magically with this COVID stuff, now everyone's online anyway, and we had everything set up, ready to go. We were already doing it. So how amazing is that? So good. Was it, did you guys get like the last flight to Thailand before it all shut down? Is that right? Yeah. So nearly the last flights. Yeah. And the plane was like, there was no one on the plane. We basically could lie down across the seats and sleep on the way here um yeah so yeah it was pretty much the last flights so yeah yeah, it's amazing and we only got you only can get like a three-month visa um but they've automatically extended our visas to end of july because like there's still no flights really so Mm. so good like i just feel so blessed i feel so we feel so lucky we're like all this like stuff that we've gone through the last five six years like that we thought was just relentless and like you know stressful it's like you know it really it helps you to like just trust the process and just um and to just really like do the work so you can tap into your intuition because that's it knows what's best for you you know that intuition is so important yeah <laughs> well, mel i mean I, I have to acknowledge you um you know there were some times in in the show today where you said you know i don't have the right words for this and i'm not clinically trained or whatever but i think one of the reasons why you're so successful is because you speak uh, not from a textbook. You don't sound like a robot, but you sound like a human being. And I think we can all relate to that. And it just makes sense to me that you guys would be doing so well because you're so effing relatable. Uh, you just feel that from the moment you start talking, you know, and, you know, um, this is the first time we've, we, you and I've spoken. I feel like we're best mates um, straight away because of that. Um, so it, it, it's definitely no surprise that people are getting, are getting the kind of results that you're speaking of, um, which is really cool. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Tom. I'm really trying to accept all your compliments. I'm like, getting like <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Getting my heart open here. It's beautiful. Thank you. For sure. <laughs> I, I think it's, I think it's important to pay people compliments when, when compliments are necessary. And um, yeah, it was just, it was just something that came up in the podcast i think it was really important to mention that especially when you said oh, i don't have the words and things fuck the words like yeah thank you tom yeah it's important <laughs> it's, it's really important. funny because like that you know giving people compliments is really like beautiful um for both people but it, it can be a um triggering experience to people because it's like throwing a rock in a pond, right? Like mm. A clear pond, but the rock hits the bottom and all the muck comes up. It's like you give someone a compliment and then in their mind, they're like, no, I'm not like really like that. I'm not that good. And all their negative beliefs start coming up. So yep. it's like in, in, and, and, and when you were just saying that, I was like really trying to receive it and then then really be aware. Sorry, I don't want to take away from your compliment. I just want to talk about my sure. experience, but like, really be aware of like, is there stuff coming up for me that is trying to contradict what he's saying or not accept or fully receive, you know, what he's saying. I think when you try and give someone a compliment or a gift and they're like, Oh no, no, no. It's like, it takes the joy away from both of you. So I think that's a a lesson for our listeners is like that in itself. See how you take compliments (laughs) and see what comes up for you. (laughs) That's such a good point. I remember um, Siobhan, telling me about when she did her breathwork teaching course, um, there was a moment there where they had to pay each other compliments and just receive it in, in full presence. Wow. And, accept them. and um, I know that Siobhan really found difficulty in that. So when, when compliments are necessary, because I'm biased, it's all the time. I really try to just like look her dead in the eye and be like, no, listen, this is really important for you to know. And she's like, <laughs> no, but it's good. She's, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> she's getting good at him now for sure. <laughs> For sure, absolutely. 
<laughs> hey, Mel, where can people uh, find you? Um, I suppose it's a good time to plug um, where people can find the Center for Healing and especially with these online courses that you're offering uh, practitioners and therapists because lots of um, therapists listen to this show um, and I think oh, your work awesome. is really brilliant. So um, please, uh, please plug all the necessary stuff. Yes. Yeah, so basically if you just go to the center for healing.com.au, that's our like um, main website where if you um, click on services and then go to online courses, you'll go to our courses website and that has all of our online courses. Um, that's um, if you want to go directly to that website, it's courses.centerforhealing.com.au. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you go to the centerforhealing.com.au, you can see actually what we put out to the world in terms of our therapy. So you'll see Ryan's story, you'll see our, um, our stories in the media as well and our mental health and addiction program, which has been the core since the start. Um, so that's where I'm still like want to keep that website. Mm. Um, Ryan's like, why don't we just move to the courses? I'm like, no, like that's, that's still our baby. <laughs> um, and so you bet you can access everything from there anyway. And obviously you can find us on Facebook and YouTube, you'll probably find that Ryan is on everything. And I, like I said to you at the start, Tom, I kind of lurk in the background <laughs> normally. You brought me out of my like dark cave here. It's I good. like to call myself a shadow worker because I'm always help, like working with people with shadows. And I like, even um, it's funny when I, um, when me and share, Ryan share a room to um, do our sessions and we'll swap and he's always got the curtains wide open, every light on. And I'm just like, oh, it's too bright. And I'm like <laughs> shutting like the curtains, like literally. Um, yeah, it's like so yin and yang. So, yeah. Yeah, that's where um, you can find us. There's not much with me but um, in there, but if you do the root cause therapy training or just type in um, what is root cause therapy in Google, you'll find me as well. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, look, I mean, I think lots of people are going to benefit from what you've said today, you know, not only from the theoretical perspective but from your own story and the energy you bring, even the fact that, you know, obviously – the unfortunate passing of your father, but like your, the energy that you brought to this podcast and everything, people are going to want to know the work you've done to get to the stage that you mm. are. So if there's something mm. that's in you, that's like evoking this sense of like, Oh, maybe I could do a little bit more of the front facing stuff. Like <laughs> I think there's so much wisdom that you bring and I think it's um, really important stuff. So um, maybe this could be the start of uh, the, the front facing stuff now. Maybe. I don't <laughs> we'll know, see. Tom. <laughs> I might go back into my cave. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, but no, I so really much. enjoyed it when um Ryan said you invited me. I'm like, oh my god, I'm so I'm so excited. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And this won't this won't be the last one for sure. Um I think there's we've got hours of work to dive into. So um love to have you back on the show and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Absolutely. Thanks guys. Peace. Bye.